So now that you've watched the lectures for Unit 4, we hope that you have a really strong understanding of not only the cast of the War on Hunger, but also some of the inner workings and how organizations work to control things like corruption or um, du duplicity in, in operations. Um, and I also hope that you really understand um, uh, what it's like to live in a, in a place where you have to receive these services. Um, I mentioned the book Nickel and Dimed. Um, which really goes through what it's like to be someone living on a minimum wage salary and then how do you walk your way through utilizing the social safety mm -hmm. nets that are there and how it's not really an easy process. You don't just show up somewhere and get food. You have to go through quite a long application process and have you know facilities and organizations mm -hmm. that help you. Right. Um, and, and that's, you know, here domestically and internationally it can get even more complicated. So right, right. Now this, this book is, I think, one of the best that I've ever seen uh, d describing what it is to be the working poor. Uh, and that is very much the face of, of hunger and poverty in, in the U.S. today, as, as, it, as it is in many first world countries, in that it's people who have jobs and who are working, but often trying to make it uh, on, on minimum wage mm -hmm. and uh, are simply not able to make that and, and yeah. not able to, to feed their uh, children, not able to live the, the lives that they, uh, that they aspire to. Uh, it, it, uh, it explains that very well. It's a very different dynamic than what we have to deal with in many third world countries. Yeah, I think one of the most alarming things, stories I'd ever heard about the, the domestic working poor um, is that somebody was um, get receiving food stamps and, and at the food bank and um, one of the workers was trying to help them out and, and they needed either, I think, money for a bus or something, mm -hmm. but they were afraid to take the money because then they were afraid that it would that not would let them, qu them qualify for, from right. the program yeah. that they knew they needed right. to be sustained. And yes. so there's, it's almost like a catch-22 of... Weigh the benefits. Do I take this benefit because I might lose this other one? And, mm -hmm. this kind of and which one's the most sustainable right. choice for me? Sure. Sure. Um, and then, you know, I think we've we've painted a fairly clear picture um, throughout the course of this this um, unit and, and the one before of differences between domestic and international hunger. Um, and, and I think both are extremely complex. Mm -hmm. But, y you know, when we look at the international playing field, we're looking at a totally different level of poverty and a totally different NGO and government organization right. operating levels. Um, what do you see as kind of the major obstacles when you work in an international setting? Well, often the, um, the corruption, transparency, accountability issues, which again, which is why we've, um, we've dedicated a whole lecture in this unit to that subject, mm -hmm. because these are, these are absolutely key issues that, uh, that we deal with every single day that can very much get in the way of, um, of achieving results. And one, because most of what we have is voluntarily given to us to, to, to program and, in, in our operations. And also, if, if there is a problem with, uh, with a perceived um, a accountability issue, real or, or imagined oftentimes, doesn't really, really matter, uh, it can completely turn off the spigot, in which case you don't get any assistance and any support then. Mm -hmm. um, uh, many, many, many um, populations who are following this in first world countries uh, are well informed and they, f and they follow what's, what's happening. And we have to make sure that we can show results and show that we are actually where we're supposed to be. And um, these are just constant concerns of ours. And th that's again why we, wh why we felt we should devote a whole section in, in this unit to that mm -hmm. subject. I think one of the most alarming things uh, about when you, when you look at corruption and when you look at how th information travels in this age of, of globalization is that one individual within a very large organization can do something unethical and it have negative ramifications for the entire organization and then also every operational unit within that organization. And so I think it can be quite alarming if you have one mm -hmm. person abusing power um, in an issue, then you know that can have a ripple down effect mm -hmm. and, and serious negative. Yeah, exactly, Indeed. exactly. Indeed. Absolutely. Um, I, I personally have experienced that. Um, both of my children are, are adopted internationally, and and you know one negative news story has actually jeopardized one of sure. the adoption of one of my children, and and it's like one random person making a seemingly random decision, um, and can then negatively the can yeah. can affect the Indeed. whole system or or change the whole system so that there's a whole nother la layer of bureaucracy or a whole mm -hmm. nother layer of of things you have to pay right. or forms right. you have to fill out. Right. Um, 
And so I think it's important to be, when you're working in a field like this, to be very cognizant of, of your ethical practices and to be very cognizant of, of knowing where you're working and, and, and recognizing the culture mm -hmm. in which you're working and, and being very respectful you know, of the people groups. Um, I think Ethiopia would be a really great example of that. Um, as a country, they, they've had several massive famines, um, but Ethiopians are, are a very, very prideful people group. They are very proud of their history, mm -hmm. very proud of their culture, mm -hmm. very proud of their heritage. And, and I think they don't desire to be seen across the globe as this, you know, people that everybody right. needs to help. Right. Um, and so I think that would be a really great example of a country that does have a lot of in NGO activity, um, mm -hmm. but as a country is really working to, to redefine what NGOs are allowed Indeed. to do. Indeed, yes. Um, and you see that in a lot of, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, where a country you know, might let NGOs come in during a time of desperation and operate schools and then kind of say, well, wait a minute, that's not what we want to teach our children. Right. Um, right. And so you see yeah. a lot of kind of ebb and flow of movement. The government's taking more control over who does what in their country. And again, this is what we should encourage. I mean, we want governments to take responsibility. They, right. are, they are the ones in charge. Uh, and, uh, and yes, this, this happens a lot back and forth. There is that ebb and flow. Uh, but generally, I always see it as a, uh, as a positive thing because it's, it's governments taking their, their rightful responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis their uh, population. And exactly. you should encourage that. Exactly, and I think you painted a, a good picture of that in the Bangladeshi ca case study because you were you know, you showed what the program was, how long it was supposed to last, and then the mm -hmm. ultimate goal of transitioning out right. and transitioning it to the government. Um, can you talk a bit about um, some of the practical things that the WFP does? Um, for example, building a, a factory that makes a certain grain or a certain product, and then how you guys transition f out of the manufacturing and la allow the, the people right. in the community to, to well, have I know ownership. The one example I've used is the development of the school feeding biscuits in Bangladesh. Um, the um, the uh, the high energy biscuits that mm -hmm. I that I was showing for the school feeding program, um, it, we we met with the private sector at, at the beginning, those involved in food processing, and explained what we were trying to do, uh, you know, for their country. We're, we're going to do this all on a commercial basis, but we found at the beginning we had to explain what it was that we were doing, and then when we issued the uh, tenders to the various companies, we wanted them to understand that this was th for the benefit of of their population, of the children, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we still said we would do it on a commercial basis, but, but we would guarantee the market to begin with. So they, they were then convinced that they could invest in the tools and the dyes that they would need to, to produce that particular biscuit based on our standards, the international standards, and we follow World Health Organization standards when it comes to these kinds of biscuits. Uh, it's a bit of a leap of faith for them at the beginning to make that initial investment, but then we explain that we're there long term. Uh, and we will guarantee the market, the bis biscuits will be produced, but then as we phase out, the government's going to come in and they will continue this and they see that this is a, a useful investment for them to make long term, mm -hmm. uh, both from an economic, commercial point of view, and, I mean they have to make profit and co cover their costs, but also because they, they, they can see that they can be a part of the solution of, of, of alleviating hunger in their country. Mm -hmm. And by and large I find that um, companies in every single case rise to the occasion when you when you approach them up, up front and explain what it, what it is that that you're trying to achieve mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I think it's important to always bear in mind um, that the goal of, of this war on hunger is to actually have an end yes not to constantly work ourselves out of a job exactly that's the idea. exactly right. and I think that's what a lot of the major players are working towards. Right. Um, and, and that it is a poss possible and achievable goal. And I think you made that picture really clear um, in, in the, the ending slides of one of your lectures where you, you showed, you know, these are in the 1960s, these were the major, you know, players that were receiving food aid, and now these are the major trading players. Yes. And um, on a commercial basis, this is not charity, this is not aid. Right. You help countries develop, they'll come back to you and they'll become part of globalization, of, of the international economy in, in the end. Mm -hmm. And we're all in the world together. We all have to, we all have to benefit from this. This is, this is critical. It right. works. Right. Um, so we hope that you um, have uh, began to understand the complexity of how operations work um, in this arena, but also began to understand, um, especially through, through the case study that Dr. Alexander showed you, of how you as an individual in your own field mm -hmm. can use what you know how to do um, and really help to, to combat some of these issues. Yes. You know, I think especially with the 
the VAM Mac being in the GIS, like you, um, as a World Food Program, you guys utilize that type of information yep. re a whole lot in, in your work, and it's a very, very valuable piece of information. Helps societies to understand how poverty and hunger works in their countries. Well, what mm -hmm. are the indicators? How does this, how does this work? Um, this kind of information is invaluable for societies to understand, one, what the problem is, and then they better understand what it is that they need to do and what tools that they need to alleviate the situation. Yeah, and, and, and the way that technology is nowadays, mm. you know, that's a very dynamic information, and yeah, so I think a lot remarkable. of countries yeah. find, you know, work like this to be extremely valuable, but I think, too, um, you know, I mean, who would have thought a geographer would be a major player in, in fighting right. world hunger? Right. Um, and so we hope that Indeed. you're encouraged by, uh, you know, this idea that it really does take everyone in their own field being an expert to, to really make a difference. Right. And as you as you um, as you go through this this, this unit, uh, this is just the one example of of the geographers making a difference in ending world hunger. Those of you who are not geographers, and we know there will be many, we want you to also think about your own chosen career, and what it is in 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 your future career path that can help to alleviate world hunger. This is just one of many examples. Exactly.